Uh, thank you so much. I'd like to thank Sages and, and our moderators for really that, giving me the opportunity to, to present this talk. I, I don't have any disclosures. So when, when you talk about uh, who's appropriate for anti-reflux surgery, you know, the first thing that may come to your mind is, well, of course, you know, patients who fail medical management. Um, but after this fan the fantastic talk that we just had, I, I really hope that in reality you realize that we should be pretty cautious and deliberate about uh, who we actually uh, select to, to do surgery on, uh, because there are numerous reasons that patients can fail medical management, and a nuanced understanding of them is really going to be important to appropriate patient selection, uh, your outcomes, and, and ultimately patient uh, safety. So <clears throat> hopefully by the end of this talk, uh, we'll have a reminder of some of the relevant uh, physiology and goals of medical and surgical therapy. We'll talk about uh, what defines a successful outcome um, and the importance of, of proper patient selection. We'll just briefly touch on uh, the, the key aspects of the preoperative workup, because I know there's another talk, and we just had a great talk on, on, on some important uh, things that we should be thinking about. And then lastly, uh, we'll spend most of our time on trying to identify some of the clearer versus more nuanced candidates for anti-reflux surgery. We're going to focus uh, specifically on laparoscopic fundoplication, not some of the newer uh, procedural treatments of reflux disease. <clears throat> so as a quick review, uh, there are four main physiologic mechanisms that are going to really protect against acid injury of the esophagus. That's going to be your esophageal clearance mechanisms, such as peristalsis, swallowing, uh, esophageal distension, uh, the mucosal integrity of the esophagus, the competence of the LES, and then your gastric, uh, gastric emptying. And these are important to keep in mind uh, as we talk about the goals of anti-reflux surgery and medical therapy and which patients are best served by either. So as we said, you know, the treatment paradigm for, for reflux disease really shifted with the introduction of PPIs, um, and they are the mainstay of treatment. I think the key point is, is that they work, uh, and, and most patients are very well managed on PPIs, and, and the main goal is really reduction, reducing acid secretion. Uh, there will, however, there is, however, a subset of patients that, despite maximum PPI therapy, require other management strategies. And one such strategy, the focus of our talk, is going to be the laparoscopic fundoplication. So it's generally a very successful uh, treatment modality with control of symptoms and about, um, I guess there's, there's a range out there, but anywhere from 60 to 90 percent of patients. Um, and this is done by kind of restoring the competency of the LES. Um, and that, this is what makes it the, the current gold standard for surgical management of GERD. However, with those success rates, as we kind of heard, there, there is a subset anywhere from, from 10 to 30, um, maybe even 40% uh, percent of patients who may experience some persistence of their symptoms or recurrence of their symptoms, and between 3 to 10% percent of patients actually may actually need an additional uh, anti-reflux uh, procedure. So what constitutes a successful outcome? So it's largely going to be defined by three factors. So achieving long-term relief of, of reflux symptoms, avoiding uh, operative complications, and then minimizing your post-op complaints. So that seems pretty simple and, and pretty universal uh, probably to most surgeries. But in practice, uh, achieving these goals can be quite difficult. And these three outcomes are going to hinge on a proper diagnosis of, of your patient's symptoms. So I'll just touch on this very briefly. Um, but before we think about our diagnostic studies, I really just want to emphasize again that, that so much can be gleaned by an accurate clinical history. Um, and that includes you know, an evaluation of how our patients responded to PPI therapy. So there's really no consensus on which tests are necessary for every patient, as we can see by our, the poll that we had at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> but many. Um, high volume centers will get these four tests with the goal to diagnose reflux, exclude other lesions of the esophagus and stomach, measure the severity of reflux, and then define your anatomy. So who are the best patients for anti-reflux surgery? So I'll first discuss those in green, um, who I think are generally kind of clearer candidates for uh, surgery. And then we'll spend some time on the categories in yellow that I think <clears throat> require more caution when you're thinking about them as potential candidates. 
So for patients with persistent complications of GERD, those are going to be your patients with benign peptic uh, strictures or high-grade esophagitis. Fortunately, we're seeing fewer and fewer of these patients um, because of how good PPIs are, but when we do see them, these findings are objective evidence of uh, severe GERD, and they represent a true failure of uh, medical treatment. Patients with uh, persistent regurgitation, so your PPIs are typically going to neutralize the acid in your reflux contents, but the regurgitation um, will persist even though the heartburn may stop. So severe regurgitation can actually be pretty uh, lifestyle limiting. So we really shouldn't understate this or discount this when, our, when we're questioning our patients because surgical therapy um, does provide excellent relief uh, in these patients. And then the last screen is patients who have an anatomic abnormality, right? So while having an anatomic abnormality, such as a hiatal hernia, in and of itself is not an indication for anti-reflux surgery, um, patients with severe GERD and hiatal hernias um, have been shown to have worse reflux, less efficient clearance, um, and a weaker LES. So if you have patients with poor control on PPIs and you're on maximum therapy, um, the fundoplication repair in and of itself um, can help address this and, and likely provide uh, better control of the patient's symptoms. So young patients, uh, this is uh, one of our first kind of mildly cautious uh, uh, categories. So patients who have objective evidence of GERD uh, who are under the age of 40 uh, with typical symptoms have a high likelihood of having progressive disease. So surgery in this scenario can actually provide long-term relief of their GERD. Um, it, they can avoid some of the complications that we just talked about, um, as well as abate some of the costs associated with long-term PPI use. Um, that said, uh, and the reason this category is kind of a mix of green and yellow, uh, is because we shouldn't forget to think about the risk of operative failure in these patients. So anywhere from 3 to 10 percent of, of patients will fail to the point of requiring reoperative surgery, and that's in expert hands. Um, so the earlier that we're operating on these patients, really uh, the longer they're exposed to this risk of failure. And as we all know, redo surgery is, is, is pretty challenging, even in the hands of experts. So if there are young patients who have good control uh, with medication, we should really be thinking about waiting uh, until their symptoms progress, or, or certainly at the very least counseling them about this risk of failure over the course of their lifetime. If we're at low volume centers um, where we don't perform this procedure regularly, we should really be waiting on these patients or sending them to high volume centers. All right, so to our first true kind of caution topic, patients with uh, respiratory complications and airway disease. So the most common GERD symptoms are going to be heartburn, regurgitation, but some patients are going to have cough, hoarseness, uh, frequent throat clearing, or asthma, and they may have those symptoms alone or um, in addition to the typical symptoms. Uh, and these so-called extraesophageal symptoms uh, can be caused or exacerbated by GERD. Uh, the important kind of clinical challenge here is really to determine whether the GERD is causative or contributing, or, or, or if it's a contributing factor uh, to their symptoms. And unfortunately, it's not as easy as it may seem because there's currently no uh, diagnostic test that clearly links uh, your airway symptoms to GERD. When the symptoms are reflux-associated, um, medical therapy may not be enough to control their disease. And so restoring the LES competency with a fund application has been shown to have some improved outcomes. Uh, and as an example of that, uh, recently there's a suggestion that there might be a benefit in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So there have been several re retrospective uh, studies that have shown uh, improvements in disease progression uh, in those patients who are receiving uh, anti-reflux surgery. And last year, there was a multi-center uh, randomized trial that was published in Lancet, which um, showed that anti-reflux surgery is safe in this population of patients. Um, but they only had 56 patients, so um, they will need a larger trial to really show if there's a true difference uh, between surgery or medical therapy. But this really highlights uh, the need for, for more research in this population um, of patients, and, and really in, in patients who have respiratory symptoms as a, as a category in and of itself.
So just as a, a final take home point in this group, um, this is a complex group of patients with multifactorial etiologies to their symptoms. So surgery is, is really likely never to be the sole solution. And, and because of that, we really should be kind of having a multidisciplinary uh, approach with our ENT, our pulmonary, and our laryngology colleagues um, to successfully work up and manage these patients. So Barrett's. So Barrett's has typically actually been listed as an indication for anti-reflux surgery, uh, and there is literature citing a regression of Barrett's with anti-reflux surgery. But when you think about it, our ultimate goal really isn't regression, right? It's uh, to prevent progression to adenocarcinoma. And, and we really haven't definitively established that anti-reflux surgery is significantly more effective than medical therapy uh, in preventing progression to cancer. So this is a 2016 uh, meta-analysis <clears throat> excuse me, that looks at the effectiveness of anti-reflux surgery and preventing uh, cancer. And if we look at the bottom of this graphic, there, there really isn't an advantage to performing anti-reflux surgery to prevent uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma. So for our patients who have uncomplicated Barrett's, the well-managed on their PPIs, really these patients uh, need just endoscopic surveillance, okay? There, there might be a role uh, in the so-called refractory Barrett, so patients who um, have kind of rare complicated disease that can't be controlled by our ablative therapies, but this is gonna be a really small group of people because we've made so many advances uh, endoscopically in terms of what we can offer uh, patients. And then uh, our, our last category, so obesity. Um, so obesity is a strong risk factor for GERD, and your incidence is going to increase uh, as your BMI increases. Uh, Anti-reflux surgery is, oh, is safe to perform in this population of patients, but your rate of uh, failure is actually going to increase, uh, particularly for patients who have a BMI greater than 30. Right? So when GERD is severe uh, in these patients, actually laparoscopic rheumatoid gastric bypass rather than a fundiplication should be what we're strongly considering in these patients, especially for patients who have a BMI greater than 35. Um, the gastric bypass is going to address the mechanisms that really um, potentiate or led to the GERD, and additionally, it can address any uh, obesity-related comorbidities. For those uh, of you who may have patients who aren't quite ready for bariatric surgery, they don't want bariatric surgery, or they're kind of in that in-between uh, 30 to 35 BMI, um, medical weight loss programs or nutrition counseling are potential options that we should be seeking before offering them uh, surgery. Uh, lastly, I, I think it's important, uh, besides the, the fantastic talk that we had, I think it's important to know what our referring docs um, think about who should be getting surgery. You know, they manage a significant part of portion of patients with GERD, um, and they send us a large portion of, of our referrals. So it, it's nice to know um, where the differences may be in opinion. So this is an interesting study uh, published last year from our GI colleagues, and essentially they brought together an expert panel of GI docs, and they asked nine hypothetical uh, patient scenarios and ranked the appropriateness of various uh, surgical, op out, uh, surgical options, excuse me, fundiplication, TIF, uh, magnetic sphincter augmentation, and if we look at the, the fundiplication, the panel was really unanimous on, only on two scenarios. So patients who had evidence of pathologic reflux, um, and then patients who had a hiatal hernia, whether it was large or small. Um, they weren't unanimous, but um, the majority of them also thought that patients with significant regurgitation um, were, were also appropriate for laparoscopic fundiplication. And then as you can see, but all the, uh, the colors that's in red, for the remaining scenarios, they, uh, they really didn't think any surgical option was appropriate. So I look forward to hopefully seeing you know, a panel, a similar panel of surgeon opinions, and, and maybe even better, a panel of surgeon and GI opinions together, uh, maybe a position statement, because really our therapies and, and many of our patients, particularly the complex ones, should be complementary as opposed to exclusionary. So uh, to conclude, uh, medical therapy works for the majority of our patients, uh, and we as surgeons should focus on selecting patients with objective evidence of GERD, uh, typical symptoms, 
persistent complications uh, and anatomic abnormalities. And then as a final point, I mean, the details matter in all of our patients all the time, but particularly with respect to GERD, uh, they matter in some of the populations that we just discussed that are highlighted in yellow. Thank you so much.